that first flurry. And you ever notice how a child's reaction to the first snowfall is really quite different than an adult's reaction to the first snowball? You know, a child looks at the first snowball and they start to jump up and down. Because to them, they think of sledding, snowball fights, and snowmen. And they would get forward to running outside and playing in the snow, the change of pace, and all the things, and all the glory and beauty that comes with snow. Now, maybe you have a brighter perspective than I do, but I think a lot of time, uh, times adults, we look at the first snowfall and we go, now I have to deal with frosty windshields and icy roads, and I gotta, sl uh, you know, I gotta plow my driveway or shovel, and we think of all the things that we have to do in the changing of the season when the first snowfall comes. Now, which of these is true? Well, they're, they're both true, right? Both things have those potential. Well, sometimes we look at the potential, or we look at the problem that may be coming with it, right? As we enter into the Advent season today, it's a special time of year. It is a special season to celebrate, as Pastor Gordon said. And we step into the season with hope. We look forward to celebrating together. We prepare our hearts for Christmas. The time that we look back and we think about that God humbled himself to come in the form of a human being to literally come and dwell among us. It's a beautiful gift that Christ came to earth to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And so today, as Pastor Gordon said, we are kicking off our new series. Our Advent series is called The Gift. And today we are talking about the gift of hope. See, it seems like something happens to us as an adult. Somewhere along the way, we start to forget about snow angels, we start to forget about snowball fights and all the glory and splendor that come with snow, and we start to think about all the problems that, that seem to come with having to deal with that change of season. I remember when my kids were little, at a time when I had, you know, three kids under the age of five, I, I don't know what we were thinking, but we had them and they were, they were beautiful, but I remember for the first time in my life, I, I've always been in Minnesota, and I used to enjoy being outside in the winter. But when I had these three babies under the age of five, and you know, it, it, instead of taking a half an hour to get out the door, now it takes two or three hours to get out the door. And you can't find one kid's boot, you can't find another kid's glove. And you know, it's just like, I remember for the first time in my life thinking, maybe pastors in Florida, Maybe, maybe we shouldn't move. Maybe we should just be done with having to deal with the season. Right? Now we've we come around and we, we enjoy the winter. But something about that transition seems to happen sometimes in our faith. Sometimes in our faith we start out recognizing the mystery and the glory of God and how God reveals himself in these, these really wonderful and beautiful ways. And somewhere along the way, sometimes we lose our perspective and the potential of what God can do. We start to look more at the problems. Right? We need to be diligent in our faith where we can begin to lose hope. Now some of us this morning are hope Bearers. We are hope carriers. We are bringing hope to those around us. And I want to encourage you to keep doing so. But some of us this morning are looking for some hope. Some of us have been searching for some hope for a while. We haven't tasted and seen the goodness that comes from the hope of God. And I want to encourage you this morning that there is hope. Some of you have been weighing in on the heaviness of this season, not just the, the winter season. But the season of the pandemic and the season of the second wave that's come through and the season of people losing loved ones and just the suffering that we've watched and as we walk through it can feel heavy. And some of us are dealing with dreams that we felt that maybe God had once put in our hearts. And now they don't seem to be there. These dreams seem to be lost. And I want to encourage you this morning that you and I are not alone. And we are not a people without hope. Hope to me is like a freight train. You think about a train that is strong and it's built to go far and it is built to go fast and it is built for a long distance and it is meant to carry a lot. 
It takes a lot to derail a train. Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. If you want to flip there, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, I'll be there just quickly. Is this microphone okay, or do I need to switch microphones? We're good. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. So Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19 say this. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable. God does not waver from his promises, it says, because it is impossible for God to lie. Our God is good, and our God does good, and our God does not do anything outside of good, so our God does not lie to us. If our God promises good for our lives, we can lean on those promises. Therefore, we who have fled to him, we who have fled to him. It takes our action going to God. God, I seek you. God, I want you. God, I desire you. I go to God. Those who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain and into God's inner sanctuary. I love that image. Hope is what brings us into the very intimate presence of our God. Now, are, you, are any of you familiar with the, the band of 10th Avenue North? They've been around for, for a while, I don't know, at least 10 years or so. 10th Avenue North. And maybe you know this song, but in one of their songs, they talk about God who walk, walks through them through both. Uh, it, walking faith in both the triumph and the tragedy, right? There, there's one line that says, the flood or the fire, God, you are with me, and you won't let go. The chorus says, I have this hope, and I would lead it to the worship team to sing the beautiful along the way that they outstretch over. I have this hope in the depth of my soul. Essentially, they quote Hebrews 6.19 that says, hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. But a train needs to be properly fueled. A train needs the right kind of fuel, or it will literally run out of steam. Right? Now, we can't, we can't go into the Advent season. We can't have a uh, you know, an, an Advent message without a good, uh, you know, text from from the, the <laughs> from the Christmas story. Here we go. <laughs> so, in Luke chapter two, verses uh, thirty-six through thirty-eight, is the story of Anna. Now, this is part of the Christmas story, but it's sometimes a little bit less known uh, section of the Christmas story. Jesus is born at this point, and Jesus has been brought to the temple for the traditional representation at the temple. So, so Anna is at the temple at the same time as Jesus and Mary and Joseph and a, and a man named Simeon. So 36 through 38 says this, Anna, a prophet or a prophetess, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phenuel from the tribe of Asher. That'll that say she's good you. Okay. So, <laughs> she was from this tribe, and she was very old. Her husband had died when they had only been married seven years. So she was probably about 21 when he died. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. And she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. She's a prophetess. And notice that it says, as Simeon and Mary and Joseph are talking, and Jesus has been, he's just been presented at the temple, she actually begins prophesying. She begins praising God because she recognizes the Messiah. She recognizes what's happening. And it says that she goes and she tells everyone who's there at the temple about who Jesus is. She proclaims that the Messiah is here. She's a prophetess. When it says that she never leaves the temple, it does not mean that she lives there. It meant that that was her occupation. 
That was her job in life. She was a prophetess, and she prophesied, so it meant that she was in the temple, doing as her occupation, and, and, be, and spent her life praising and, and worshiping God. And so she gets to witness the birth of the Messiah. She had clung to the hope of the Messiah, just like many, many other Israelites had done. And yet she and Simeon were the living, breathing representation of the hope that the Israelites had for the coming Messiah. And if you are feeling discouraged this morning, I want you to be encouraged by Anna's story. She remained faithful to God. She clung to that hope, and God was faithful to her. And God will be faithful to us. Now, can you imagine what it might be like to ride a train for the first time? I mean, we have some, even if we've not ridden a train lately, we have some kind of concept of this, right? Because we get in our cars, I think most of us drove here in cars, you know, our parents did, and, and we have an idea about what it you know, means to get behind a wheel and go fast, right? But can you imagine for the first time experiencing something that can move that far and that fast? Or just think about how trains change, they transformed our ability to ship cargo, right? No longer did things have to be hauled on a wagon or maybe a steamboat across the waterway and back on a wagon, right? Now they could build bridges and, and the trains could travel. They were meant to go across the country and carry things, to carry a lot of cargo fast and far. It changed how we had access to things. It changed how we, as people, were able to navigate this country, how we were, and in Europe too, and in other places in the world, but how we were able to get from different places. So when I'm not reading, you know, books of theology or resources for others, uh, my favorite genre to read, if I ever find this chance, you know, chance to do that, is historical fiction. That, that's my genre of choice. And so last year I was reading this, this really great book about a woman who, it was her story of being on the Oregon Trail. Now for the women, it was their lot in, in the Oregon Trail, it was their position to literally walk across the country. Children rode in the wagons, they didn't need the wagons, it was dangerous. Men drove the wagons and women walked. So this woman literally walks across the country. And then it describes near the end of her life, and at the end of the book, how she rides a train for the first time. And just how magnificent it was to be able to go that fast and to travel point A to point B that quickly and, and, and just that kind of distance that wasn't available to people before. Can you imagine walking across the country and then being able to just go this distance in such a short period of time? And this is what hope is like for us. It carries us farther and faster. When trains, uh, they, they used to be called, maybe they, they still are, but they, when they first started to build trains, they called them the Iron Road. I love that title, because it just speaks to the strength that the trains have, right? And, and hope is like an Iron Road for us. It carries us farther and faster. Anna and others clung to text the promises, the prophecies that were found in places such as Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16, and there's lots of other prophecies of the coming Messiah, but this particular one says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the things that I have promised them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from the King David's line. He will do what is just, and right throughout the land. And in that day, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety, and this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. God promised the coming of Christ. The Israelites clung to that promise. What has God promised in your life? What has God been stirring in your soul. I want to encourage you this morning not to give up, not to get discouraged. Don't give in to the discouragement because even if you haven't seen it yet, and even if it's harder than you think it was going to be, or even if you've run with the things that you weren't expecting,
expecting. Cling to hope like a freight train. Trains need to be fueled. The dangers of trains is that they can be derailed or that they can run out of steam. And feeding our faith is like making sure that our train has been fueled. What happens if our train is derailed? Right? More, more than likely, many of us have faced some kind of suffering, and we're likely to face more suffering at some point in our life, our trials. But we have a recipe. Scripture gives us a recipe for, for how to focus, how to, the potential that can come out of the things that we walk through. Romans chapter uh, 5, verses 3 through 5, and there's a very similar text in James chapter 1 and in 2 Peter chapter 1. But Romans chapter 5 is the one we'll focus on today. 3 through 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Oh, that is not intuitive <laughs> for us to visit. I'm facing problems and trials, and we naturally rejoice? No. <laughs> At least I don't. It takes me a minute to get there, right? But it says, rejoice, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Our God, who is good, our God, who is love, we want to know what love feels like. It's God. God is love, and our God is good, and our God does not move outside of goodness or of love, and he offers that love to us by the power of his presence and the Holy Spirit available to us. So it says, look at the potential of your trials to lead us to endurance. The endurance builds our character. The character strengthens our confident hope. Hope is not a lack of trials or suffering. Hope is a freight train that carries us through our trials. We have hope in what God is doing in our lives and in what is to come. Both what we can walk through here on earth, but also the promises that God has for us for a future glory. We can rest our hope in what is to come. Hope is a gift for our souls. Let us pray. Lord, we give you praise. We thank you that you are love and you've loved us so much that you willingly pour out your presence, that we may know you intimately, that we may be with you. You love us so much that you actually came to earth to be with us. We praise you. And we praise you that we can hold fast, that we can cling to your promises. But like a strong freight train, God, they give us hope. It is your presence, it is your hope that carries us through all moments, the triumphs and the tragedies, the victories and the times when we go to battle. God, we lean into you, we lean into your presence, we lean into who you are, and we praise you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can put our confident hope in you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.